The script this morning is from Isaiah, the 44th chapter, verses 6 through 8. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first, I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and, yet, and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. Amen. So the other day, is my microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So the other day I was having this uh, conversation with a chicken. His name was Todd. And I said, uh, Todd, are you aware there is a very real possibility that at some point in time in the near future, either myself or one of my friends is likely to kill you and to eat you? And Todd said, well, believe it or not, that's something as chickens we, we think about. Uh, we know we've got a shorter lifespan, and I think I speak for all chickens when I say that I've spent many hours gazing into the abyss of my own mortality. And I recognize that this is coming. And so what I've decided is that whatever point a human is going to kill me and eat me, I've decided that what's going to become of my body is that I'm going to be served up as a special dinner on the president's table at the White House. And I'm gonna provide a really nice meal for people who've gathered for some fantastic occasion. And I said, Todd, can I be really honest with you? And he said, uh, sure. I said, uh, Todd, I don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, all the way from South Texas, the, chan the chances of them bringing you all the way to Washington, D.C., it's not going to happen. In fact, Todd, if I can be a little morbid, I think best case scenario, you might end up as somebody's fajitas uh, at lunch after church. More likely though, you might just as likely end up as some five-year-old's chicken nuggets that they don't even want to eat because there's no barbecue sauce. And when they pitch a temper tantrum and they throw your body all over the floor, I hate to tell you their mother is probably not going to say, don't throw Todd on the floor. I mean, Todd gave his life for your lunch. We're going to pick him up. No, instead she's going to say, that's yucky. And she's going to say about you, Todd, let's just throw that in the garbage now. So what do you think about that, Todd? And Todd said, wow, that's hard, hard to hear, but ultimately I have to recognize as a chicken, all I can really do is just be the best chicken that I know how to be and trust that whatever becomes of me after I'm gone is really in someone else's hands. So that's an absurd story, but in, in this passage we're going to look at today in Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah is talking about idolatry. And it's a story that involves some elements where it blends back and forth between are we talking about something funny or something pathetic? Because it's in some ways a, a very humorous passage, and in other ways uh, it's something that's really awful to think about. But he talks about this issue of idolatry, and specifically he reminds us to think about the trees that are involved in this. A tree doesn't get to decide what will become of it. Instead, people do that. You have to wonder sometimes, I mean, this, this pulpit right in front of me, at, this, at some point this was a tree somewhere. You wonder where it was, where it came from. What tree was it that would one day become this pulpit that I'm speaking behind? And on the other hand, what tree that had been planted right beside it might have just ended up as someone's firewood? Which will be the parts that we stain and preserve? Which will be the parts that we cast aside? But Isaiah is talking to us about someone who would base their life around worshiping an idol, worshiping something that they'd made with their own hands. And he says this is something that is pathetic and ridiculous. And as much as we might want to laugh along as we read the passage, it also has a way of getting personal with us as we look at it. 
Uh, I appreciated Sean's reflections on Isaiah chapter uh, 27 this morning. I feel like of all the communion passages I assigned, that was probably the weirdest one. I don't guess you've used that one in communion before, but thinking about God, thinking about Yahweh, the God of Israel, slaying Leviathan, this is a way for them to say that God is over all the forces of chaos in the world. God is over any other God that people worship. God is the ultimate force in the universe. He's the one who will have the victory. He's the one in whom we should place our trust. For them to talk about Yahweh slaying Leviathan, this would be kind of like those images that people post sometimes of Uncle Sam kneeling before the cross. You know, sometimes we say, I I would like to hope that Uncle Sam, I'd like to hope that America is a country that reveres the Lord, but if we do not, make no mistake that we will be humbled before God if we reject God. But that was the message in Isaiah chapter 27, that God does reign supreme and will reign supreme. I wanted to read kind of an extended passage this morning because Isaiah just describes this all so well. But he's talking about in his own lifetime walking around and seeing some of these very skilled craftsmen who chop down a tree and then form it into an idol. And so I'm going to read this passage from Isaiah 44. And as I read it, I've got a little video clip I'm going to have playing in the background just for you to look at. So just kind of let your mind go where it goes. But I'm going to read this passage from Isaiah 44 beginning in verse 9. He says, all who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble, let them stand forth. They shall be terrified, they shall be put to shame together." The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak tree and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts it and is satisfied. Also he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. And this is where he's going in verse 18. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire and baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? So Isaiah is watching all this unfold, and I appreciate you letting me read kind of a longer passage, but he's watching all this unfold of these talented craftsmen, and he says on some occasions they even plant the tree that they're going to one day build into something that they worship. They pick out a tree or they plant it, God sends the rain, it's nourished, it waters, it grows. And he says, how could you ever fall down and worship something made by human hands, especially if you're the one who yourself built it. You cooked your dinner with the same wood you made the, the, the fire of, and then, then you use that same wood to make an idol that you're bowing down to. And his big question is, how do people not think about this? And in this passage, he even makes reference to that 
passage we looked at in, in a prior week about the central message of Isaiah, that you're going to go out and preach and people are going to close their eyes and close their ears and harden their hearts. And he makes reference to that in this passage once again. People who should be asking these obvious questions, why are we doing this? Instead, he says, their eyes are closed, their ears are closed, their hearts are hardened. And so a central message in all of Isaiah is the way that God is superior to any other option we have on the table, any other thing in which we might try to put our hope and our confidence. God is greater than any of the idols. There's not even any comparison. I think Isaiah would remind us in this text of several ways in which God is superior to anything else that we could look at. Uh, one of the ways that this is true of God is that God is eternal. Some of the language that gets used in this passage reminds us of what Jesus says in Revelation about being the Alpha and the Omega. Here, here in Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 8, God is saying, I am the first and the last. I am before all things. I will be after all things. A critical difference between God and anything else we might put our confidence in is that all other things we make in our own image and from our own ideas. But God is the only one who forms us in His image and from his ideas. God is before us. God precedes us. God understands us because we are his created things. And when we exchange our vision of the almighty God who is eternal for something lesser, we talked about this last week, we start becoming lesser ourselves. He even says in that first verse, all who worship idols are nothing. You chase after nothing. You put your hope in nothing. You become nothing. You become something less than what it is you were intended to be. But he would remind us that God is different than any other option because God is before all things and after all things. God is eternal. Another thing that he talks about is the way that God holds the future and knows the future. In fact, that's one of God's challenges to all the idols, isn't it? Let them try and declare what will happen before it happens. I'm not much of a fan of people reading horoscopes, but I was trying to think of what would be a modern example of people who try and predict the future. And I think the most common example I could point to would be meteorologists, right? If we were to say we have modern day prophets, these are guys who try a day at a time to tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. And with all their sophisticated technology, billions of dollars in satellites that roam the earth and take pictures and measuring instruments around the face of the earth where we're looking at barometric pressure and all these different factors, even with all the harnessed power of technology and everything that we've got just to figure out within a few degrees and whether or not it's going to rain, a lot of the time we fail at it, don't we? So difficult to know what's going to happen. And in truth, as a lot of our people try to write the history of human events, we can't always agree even on what happened in the past. There's conflicting reports. Who do you trust? Who remembers it better? Who's, whose version is an accurate version? We can't even agree on the past, much less the future. But God sets himself apart from all others because whereas the idols, the man-made things, they hear nothing, they say nothing, they do nothing. God declares the future before it happens. He announces it before it arrives so that when it arrives, we can see it and rejoice. And I think in, in talking about this, Isaiah reveals another very important aspect of God, which is the mysteriousness of God. One of my problems with many competing world religions is when they describe what they think God is like, in my mind, their version of God is understandable and therefore way too simple. Uh, any God that I can comprehend is not a God strong enough to save me from the problems I've created for myself. Uh, one of the things about God and the nature of God, uh, in Scripture, often we, we read passages about what God is, how God functions, the way that God moves in the world, and, and so many of these things kind of get outside of our ability to completely grasp them. God is someone who's mysterious, and one of the mysteries that he points to in this passage is he says that God has appointed an ancient people. He says, I'm before all things and I've appointed an ancient people. And I want you to think about in Isaiah's context, they don't really know who Jesus is going to be or even fully understand what the Messiah is going to be. What do you think they would make of a statement like that? Yeah, God's appointed an ancient people. It's clear that the God of Israel has favored Israel, but why? Why is he doing that? There was nothing about them that was morally superior to any other nation. He didn't rescue them from slavery because they were especially deserving of rescue. There was nothing about Israel 
that made them better than anyone else, yet God chose them and favored them. And reading this through a Christian lens, we understand it was because through the family of Abraham that Christ was coming into the world. Passages like this one become much clearer for us than they would have been for Isaiah's audience. Why appoint this ancient people? Why hang on to this one people group? Because God is declaring the future before it happens. He latched on to Israel because he knew who it was that was going to be born as a son of Israel, as a son of David, who was going to bring redemption to the world. So the mysteriousness of God is also something that reminds us God is greater than us. He's different than us, but also in being that, he gives us something to aspire to. And so Isaiah is pointing out the vastness of God and, and, and how amazing He is and eternal He is and wise He is. And he says, in contrast to this, anyone who is putting their faith in something that is man-made, man-created, man-maintained, he says what they end up doing is feasting on ashes. He says, beasts of the field are intended to eat lush grass. Humans are intended to eat bread. But a person who puts their trust, their full trust in themselves or in something man-made, in the end, they end up just chewing on ashes. It all turns to ashes in their mouth. So we can look at these passages about idolatry, and on the one hand, we might say, you know, we're, we're here in the, the enlightened West. We don't bow down to blocks of wood anymore. How could anyone have ever done something so ridiculous as the way these people would bow down to idols? And I wonder if we could give some of those ancient people a fair shot to look at our lives the way that we're able to examine their lives. And I wonder if they might ask us some similar questions. You think about how many hours you're working, how much you absolutely wear yourself out for some of the things that you have or the way that you're wanting to be seen. And just as we might ask them some question, how could you ever take something that you made with your own hands and treat it like it was something that was so important? I wonder if the ancients might watch us and say, why is it that you work such ridiculously long hours to purchase things that you don't need to impress people that you don't like when you already know as soon as you buy it, you've got a list of other things you think you've also got to buy before you can ever achieve happiness? Why would you be so ridiculous? But how often do people persist in these behaviors? So on the one hand, we might say, we understand and we know there's nothing in our life more important than walking with the Lord. There's nothing to me more important than my relationship with God. There is no more driving force in my life than seeing my children grow up to walk in God's footsteps, to love the Lord and serve the Lord. But we have to think honestly and ask ourselves that question, would my actions, the actual things that I do from day to day, would those things call my bluff if I were to take an honest look at them? What I say my priorities are, what I say is most important versus what I'm really using all of my energy to worship and to try to attain, the things that I want to have, the ways that I want people to think about me. Isaiah reminds us that it is ultimately our decision how we're going to use this life that we've been given. Isaiah chapter 44 in verse 23 uh, he says, sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains, you forests, and all your trees. If people are walking in the footsteps of God, serving God, even the trees and the mountains can be happy about the way that they're being used because they also have this desire to be used to the glory of God, not subjected into being made into some kind of an awful idol that the people were worshiping. But in the end... A tree doesn't get to decide what's made of it any more than a chicken, I guess. But created things, things that are beneath us, don't get that say. But as human beings, we have so much control in what it is we're going to do with our lives, and we have the ability to take ownership uh, in our destiny. Uh, on Wednesday nights, I've been, I've been leading a group, and uh, we've been trying to carve out time deliberately each Wednesday night uh, to do three simple things, really. Uh, one is to sincerely pray in a quiet, and reflective fashion. Another is to deeply reflect on a passage of Scripture, trying to listen as if we were taking it seriously. And then also to interact with one another, uh, to interact with our other fellow believers and trying to discern these things together. Uh, but I've been telling them every week, I, I really believe that a, that a spiritual life, a life that's centered on God, is actually a form of rebellion. And so when you think about in your life, the stuff that's keeping you awake at night, the stuff that makes you feel somehow less as a person, 
What are those things that the world is telling you that you need that are making you somehow feel diminished? So whether that's your need to achieve things so that you feel like you've got accomplishments, that your need for accolades, your need for material success, do you need people to see you a certain way? It's important as Christians that we deliberately push back on all of those things against some kind of a need to just achieve things, to recognize that, that I achieve things out of gratitude for God because God already loves me. God already redeemed me. When we understand who it is that we're worshiping and we find our, our peace and our identity in God, we feel very free to rebel against some of the other things the world is telling us that we have to have or that we have to be. That if God really is our all in all, we can see created things for what they are. Certainly some things to be used to the glory of God, things to be used for ministry, opportunities to serve. But in the end, we've got to take ownership of our own destiny. If we don't want to just end up eating ashes like everyone else around who is finding all their value in created things, If we really center ourselves in the Lord, find our purpose in the Lord, find our greatest joys in the Lord, we end up in a much happier and a more secure place. That God has called on us as Christians to follow him, the ancient one, the alpha and the omega, the one who was before us, the one who goes ahead of us, the one who will be waiting for us at the end. If we put all of our hope in him, we conduct our life in such a way that communicates that, that we know he's the most important, therefore we treat him as the most important. When we do those things, we're going to get to the destination that we're wanting to go. Our problems are much greater than us. And no matter how much we enjoy some of our man-made solutions or the man-made ways that we distract ourselves from our problems, in the end, it's only God who can satisfy our soul's deepest thirsts. As you think about your own life this morning, just the way that we can look at those ancient idolaters and say, how could they do the things that they're doing? I wonder if you could take a step back and just look at yourself and say, the things that I say are most important, the things that I say matter most, how much does my actual life look like it lines up with that? How much are the things I'm actually doing aligning with the things I say that I care the most about that are most worthy of my time and my efforts? That's a question that all of us have to keep asking and to keep wrestling with. This is a time that we set aside where if there's someone who has a a special need or request or there's some way that we could be an encouragement to you, uh, we like to do that as a church family. So uh, if there is anyone this morning who needs to respond, uh, we would invite you to come forward as together we stand and sing this song.